Welcome to Question Mark, the podcast. Exploring the greatest story ever told with open minds and open hearts. We light it up, we won't come down. And the sun can't stop us now. Watching it come true, it's taking over you. This is the greatest show where it's covered in all the colored lights. And the runaways are running the night. Impossible comes true, it's taking over you. This is the greatest show. Hello and welcome to Question Mark, a fortnightly podcast about the greatest story ever told, Mark's Gospel. Whether this is the first episode you've listened to or you're a regular listener, you are very welcome here. My name's David Payne and I'll be your host and guide on this, the 23rd episode of our journey through this ancient tale with a surprisingly contemporary feel. I hope you're ready to join us on this unique adventure of faith and life. And today it's my great pleasure to introduce our special guest, David Hewitt. Uh, Steph tells me he introduced him to the Edinburgh Fringe and is the leader of Wellsprings Community in Edinburgh. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself in a minute. And I'm assuming you probably know Stefan Smart, who start, recently started performing his I Am Mark performances again this year having learnt Mark's gospel by heart as a theatrical performance a number of years ago. He's shared his story with thousands of people in a huge range of environments over the years. So we'll let the guest go first. David, would you like to start by saying who you are, maybe a bit more about how you fit in with uh, Stefan and the Iron Mark journey, and perhaps what you're interested in Mark's gospel is? Great, yeah, thank you, David. Um, yes, well, I first met Mark, uh, I'm sorry, I met... <laughs> uh, Stefan, about four years ago, Stefan, when you first yeah. came up, uh, and uh, great to uh, get to know him and experience the I Am Mark presentation. Um, yeah, but we, we're a sort of creative church here on the edge of Edinburgh. We call ourselves Wellsprings Community. Uh, been here about uh, 15 years now on the edge of the city. And uh, I used to be on the team of a city centre church and then in about 2006 it seemed that the Lord was just sort of like stirring something within us to, to plant something new on the edge of the city and we were released to do that um, and uh, as particularly sort of creative prophetic sort of bunch of folk wanted to to help us start something different here in an old church building it was actually a disused church building uh, it had uh, become a piano warehouse for about 20 years um, when we came along I'm also an architect by profession, so that helped. I was able to do some plans for renovating it, subdividing it. Uh, we actually now live in the building up in the roof. Um, there are various rooms, bedrooms in the building. There's a garden plant as well as a big church gathering space. We call the upper room. It is, it is a, on the upper level and there's a, a prayer room at the side of the building. Uh, in addition, there's a small school, actually, it's a Christian school that, that uses um, a classroom on the ground floor. So, yeah, the, I think the Lord said to us at the time it would be an adventure. I just turned 50 and it was just like a new chapter to our lives. And it definitely has been an adventure, but uh, we're still here 15 years later. <laughs> and what, what sort of um, creativity are you involved in there? Well, uh, dance has always actually been important to us. My, my wife um, was very much into dance and dram drama, amateur dramatics. My daughter inherited those genes and uh, so as part of the expression of worship we have linked to a group called Movement in Worship which uh, came out, out from Brighton with a man called Andy Au. We've, we've sort of held workshops and summer schools and missions and different things over the years. Um, painting, art, <laughs> I'm keen on, on art and uh, so is my family, so is several in the church. We just like to see a very, I suppose our style of gathering as a church is very, we, we try to encourage something very participatory, um, meet in the round. We're not a large church, but we try to emphasize community and the sense of not having necessarily a, you know, a front where people do the stuff, but rather, you know, there's worship leaders or there's leaders of the meeting who help facilitate things, but it's very much a corporate expression together. And that, that's what we seek after. And uh, yeah, that's where we're going. 
Great, thanks very much. And if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see some of the artwork on um, Spotify and elsewhere. You can't, but uh, there's always that <laughs> option. Uh, well, I can see it's going to be an interesting journey trying to work out different ways of introducing Stefan in each episode. <laughs> Stefan set up this question mark podcast and presented it with guests for the first 21 episodes on his own. Recently, we were chatting and he asked whether I'd like to join him and help out. So here we are. Stefan, would you like to add anything maybe particularly about your relationship with David and why you invited him on the show? Yeah, and also to say thank you, David Payne, for all you are doing. It definitely helps me just to be a little bit more relaxed and to be able to think a little bit about the passage myself. I'm very oh, grateful. Great. You do this work much better than I do, I have to tell you. I, I can already see that. And it's good to see David here as well, because David, um, you've been remarkable in terms of your hospitality and friendship over the years. And I know I couldn't have done anything I, that I wanted to do in Edinburgh without you. Um, and it's been absolutely brilliant to get to know this David. Um, I, I do deeply respect him. I don't wanna, hope I don't spare your blushes there, but I honestly do. And um, I think you're a wonderful guy. And I'm so looking forward to this, this particular episode because um, I think it's gonna be really, really interesting because of that. Um, I think really I haven't got anything much to say except um, yeah, David, David Hewitt has been very hospitable to me over the years. I know his prayer room intimately, um, having slept there most of the time. So thank you again. Great. Well, after the introductions, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts, both of your thoughts about the intriguing passage. It's a conversation between friends. And uh, we can disagree if that happens, but that's no problem at all. Without further ado, should we get started? Absolutely. Uh, if you lovely listener would like to comment on anything you hear today, please do join in and share your thoughts uh, about the passage on social media, especially on the I Am Mark community Facebook page. I'll say a bit more about that later. So here is today's passage from Mark's Gospel, which is gonna be read for us by Lucy Warner, a good friend of the show. Over to you, Lucy. Mark chapter 6, verses 6b to 13, New International Version, Jesus sends out the twelve. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Lucy. And now I'm going to be interested to hear from David and Stefan. Um, about how the passage fits into the whole of Mark's gospel. And then after that, we'll go on and have a look at the detail of, of the passage. So maybe David first, how do, how do you see the passage fitting in with Mark's gospel? Okay, yes, thanks, David. Um, I mean, I think it's an exciting passage because here we have this uh, incredible story of the gospel, which Jesus has been presenting as he's been touring around the villages, you know, demonstrating the kingdom of God. It's now being carried out, taken further out by his followers, by the disciples. Uh, and uh, so it's just like things have whole moved to a whole new stage, you know, and I, I think it's helpful for me anyway, to see it in terms, to take a few steps back and see it in terms of the meta narrative of, you know, all that, if, if you like, God is doing through this, through through what he's telling us, through the Gospels, through through the New Testament, through through the Scriptures, there's, there's a it fits into this huge, wonderful story. Um, I quite like reading uh, the Passion version. I don't know the Passion Bible. I don't know if you've come across that translation by Brian Simmons. Um, he starts you know the beginning of Mark by this is the this is the beginning of the wonderful news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, uh, in the Aramaic, he says, uh, you, it could be translated, this is the revelation of Jesus, or this is the unveiling of Jesus. And, and so, you know, as this, as this goes, this story unpacks through the various chapters of Mark, we just see this unveiling of the wonder 
of this man Jesus and all that the good news represents. Um, I think you know I we've been on a journey the last ten or fifteen years to explore more of the whole Trinitarian understanding um, of the gospel. I think you know just loving to to read. Uh, more about the early church fathers and how people like Athanasius understood you know the, the gospel and what it meant and uh, so from a Trinitarian perspective you know before the creation of the world you know, the Godhead you know decided to to bring forth this uh, this way of including us in the relationship of the Trinity and, and the Godhead through Jesus and and so here you know we have Jesus Christ the mystery revealed um, sending out the, the word sending out the message through through the disciples to to those uh, who are willing to listen uh, it makes me think of you know hebrews 1 that you'll be familiar with that you know that in the past god spoke through in various ways you know through the prophets but but you know in these last days he's spoken to us by his son <laughs> and so this is if you like a fulcrum point of history this is a, a seismic shift you know, something's happening here that is that's been building up to all through history and now you know this this particular chapter I think is another fantastic step on that incredible unveiling and and uh, so it's so exciting that Jesus Emmanuel God with us you know it, it, he, he's come not not just to be an example for us but really to be an example of us you know there's, there's so much we know just packed into that understanding of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Um, but I think it was Barth who said uh, that, Karl Barth, that, that God refuses to be God without us. <laughs> and, and, you know, and here, you know, in the incarnation, he's become man and forever wedded himself to his creation through, through being born of Mary as a man. But, you know, now he's involving us in the story. And so here we have the disciples involved in the story, you know, going out, sharing, demonstrating the power of the kingdom you know he and it's it's showing that it's not a, it's not just like personal philosophy or it's not just it's not just a, a religious ritual this this is life and it involves us with god it, we're doing it together you know it, we're all involved uh, participating you could say in this gospel so uh, i think it's so exciting that's that, that's that's my my stirring for this <laughs> yeah that is certainly very stirring. Thank you. Um, Stefan, is that how you see it? Are you, have you got some other thoughts about how it fits in? How does it I, I'm just in awe, in awe of what David just said, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's great to be able to look at the whole meta narrative, as he puts it, in the way he, that he has. I, I was particularly resonating, David, with the idea of uh, the unveiling uh, yeah. and the passion translation. For me, in, in, in a sense, that helps me understand this passage, but quite a lot of other passages in Mark, because it does seem to me that there's a, a continual unveiling. Uh, it's like there is a veil, nevertheless, before you have the unveiling. So that's not absolutely crystal clear. You, you kind of have to be very attentive. But nevertheless, the object is to unveil. Mm -hmm. And I think for both the reader and for the disciples, so Jesus is unveiling about who he is and why he came is a lesson for us, but also for the disciples. And sometimes we get it just like them, and sometimes we don't. And I think that's that's the crucial, are we gonna get it? Are we gonna listen attentively enough? Um, so I, I like that, what you said. And I, for me, the passage for me, in terms of its context in Mark, it kind of it amazes me because although it seems like it's almost like Set a kind of thing that Mark's thrown in just as a kind of a bridge, you know, getting onto the more important stuff a bit later on. Actually, these few verses carry with them so such important themes that have already run through the story, such as Jesus's identity, such as his authority, um, the content of his preaching or his proclaiming. Um, and I think as such, the fact that it also as David just said, it actually implicates us as disciples as well, means that this is a particularly pertinent passage for us in the present era as well. I think it, we need to be paying attention to this, whereas perhaps our temptation might be this to feel this is a rather insignificant passage. 
Great. So let's look at the passage in detail then, shall we? Maybe the first bit, I'll just read it to remind us. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. Where do you want to start, David? <laughs> Clearly in the preceding chapters, there's been this going around, demonstrating, healing, delivering. Yeah, there's been... Jesus has been showing the power and the presence of the kingdom of God everywhere he goes. Um, and then there's gradually, you can almost just see like his strategy here, you know, he took them, the three, didn't he, into to, to, for the healing of Jairus' daughter and so forth. And there's gradually, and now we have the 12 and obviously not in Mark, but in other gospel, you know, in Luke, we've got the 70 that go out later. And there's, there seems to be a, a development here I was just thinking about the twelve. They're inter it's interesting. I mean, obviously, we know the the, the disciples. They, they were appointed back in chapter three in Mark. But but um, interesting that twelve obviously resonates. You know, in, in the in the way that the Gospels have so many layers and there's so many allusions to uh, Old Testament as well. Twelve. You know, I'm sure we would agree. You know, reflects as well also the twelve the twelve tribes. Uh, uh, you know. Um, uh, so it's interesting that, that Jesus chose 12 there, but also, um, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's other allusions as well. The, the, the um, uh, 12 spies that Moses sent into the land, you know, and uh, they failed to go into the promised land. But here you've got Jesus sending out 12 to announce the promise. The promise has come. Jesus, the promise is here. Um, and uh, Joshua, you know, in the beginning of uh, chapters three and four, you know, they when they do enter the promised land, he, he chooses 12 men to go and they place, if you remember, after they've crossed the, the Jordan, they place 12 stones as, as markers in the Jordan. And it just seems that, you know, in the way biblical writers do, you know, there are all these things to remind us of, of, of the significance uh, and all that has come before, all that God has spoken, like Hebrews said, what is now actually reached its 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 wonderful climax in the in the sun and and the coming of the kingdom of God in in, in, in the kingdom of God being at hand and uh, yeah I, I think it's uh, it's so exciting and obviously it goes on to when it's seventy people allude to seventy nations I think Genesis ten lists seventy nations and so maybe this is a building up twelve representing Israel but. The seventy will be like the world, and so I just see a I see a, a growing strategy here of this unveiling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like I like what you said there, David. I, I I totally agree. It's like I think it's so often the case that when we read something like Mark's Gospel, we forget that it has um, so much in the background from the Old Testament, and actually Jesus's message of salvation here is is Israel shaped and yeah. so yeah the 12 clearly for me also it represents the 12 tribes and I think it underlines what I'm beginning to understand as Jesus's kind of calling how he saw his calling as renewing Israel it's like that's his the, the first step the Gentiles as you said come very very soon after but it's the it's the renewing of Israel that's at the core of the message um I, I i don't know one I, for me about this this little section um is there are two or three things that i think if if i were really paying attention i'd really begin to quiz and that is the why two by two and i'd be interested to hear your views on that and and also this authority over impure spirits what's what's so important about that nothing else is mentioned there's not at this point Nothing is mentioned about preaching, actually, although it seems that's what they ended up doing. But what's highlighted is the authority over impure spirits. And I think, I think for me, that's what I was referring to earlier about the nature of the message. Uh, and if, I, if we think about it, if Jesus's message is such and such, which maybe we'll go on to define, then maybe that message ought to be ours today as well. <laughs> maybe that the gospel, according to Mark, 
has is, has a slightly different flavor to the one that is perhaps often per propagated. And I think for me, the message is to do with this uh, word authority. Hmm. So it suggests that impure spirits are under the authority of the disciples. And clearly the authority that is being talked about here isn't their own. It's, it's Jesus's. He shares his authority with them. He gives them his yeah. authority. And authority has to do with God himself, that God is in charge and he is now showing his authority through his son, Jesus, who is the king. And he's coming, as you were saying, David, he's, the kingdom of God has come. It's arrived. And it's an authority that's being demonstrated over all that's evil and all that's wrong in the world. And impure spirits are important because that they illustrate precisely that fact that the combat between Jesus and the evil spirits isn't some kind of voodoo witch hunt it's much more important than that it's all about who's going to win out in the end is it going to be the power of evil or the power of good and jesus is coming here now to reclaim the world for god um so in giving i'm just thinking about that now as i speak it's amazing to think that these disciples have been given that kind of authority that they are now representing god in the world against the forces of evil and so i think that's a really you know it's easy to skip over gave them authority over impure spirits actually in terms of the economy of mark's gospel so far it's like a big thing that's been being shared there huge um and i think the two by two i was going to talk about the two by two but i'll stop there because i've talked enough what, what, what about you david or, or david. other david what do you think this seems to me to be a very sudden, I mean, everything in Mark is sudden, isn't it? Suddenly the disciples are given this enormous job to do. It seems like a big leap from walking around with Jesus and, and watching him and, and falteringly and not, not really succeeding very well. Um, how, how must it have been like, what, what must it have been like for the disciples, do you think? Mm. Were they ready for it? What do you think, David? <laughs> No, I'm sure they were <laughs> scared out of their wits. But uh, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, to me, the two, two by two has it's obviously there's practical aspects, probably, you know, you encourage one another, this may be, this is maybe, a, you know, there's also there's a sense of support, you know, uh, as well for one another, one saying something, the other one comes in, you know, there's a, but, um, and, I, and I think there's possibly, again, if we allude to some of the biblical background, there's, there's this thing of two being important, isn't it? There was, uh, something was established by the two witnesses, you know, that's back in, in Deuteronomy, and, and I think Paul picks it up again in Corinthians, so there's, there's clearly, that's, that's important in Jewish thinking. Um, maybe it's also that, you know, a threefold cord is not easily broken, and there's the two of them, but they're, they're actually having the presence of Jesus as they go in that authority, so yeah. there's something about that. So, you know, um, maybe these are illusions we, we, we can make. Um, Jesus later says, two or three of you are gathered together, there I'm in the midst of a, you know, so there's, there's all these sort of links, and two, going out in two is so different to going out as a solitary person, it's, it, it, it brings up just another whole dimension. Yeah, I think you're right. I think this idea of two by two suggests they're going out to, as it were, prove a case, because in Jewish law, you'd have to do that. You'd have to bring two witnesses in, in a court of law. And so it, that kind of makes it makes their case authoritative. Yeah. Um, it underlines that nature, that notion of authority. Um, and and they thought I suppose what they're doing is witnessing to what they've seen. And they've been they've been with Jesus and they've seen They've seen what he's done and what he's taught. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, in order to answer your question, David P, I, I don't know if we can speculate too much. I agree with you that it's, it's, it may be quite helpful too. But I think from the evidence of a text, I would say, how did they react? The evidence of a text suggests to me they probably reacted really badly in a sense. And, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll hold my, my piece at that point. Because I don't, I don't want to mention more until we get to the point that might suggest that. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next bit, shall we? <laughs> he gave them instructions to take nothing for the journey except a staff. 
uh, to wear sandals, but not, not an extra shirt. And then when they enter the house, stay there till they leave the town. And if a place won't welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. What can we take out of that? There's a lot, isn't there? But where are you going to start, David? Yeah, I mean, I think Jesus gave them instructions. Uh, I mean, we don't, we don't know because it, obviously it's 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 a, it's packed in, and there's a summary here. So obviously, possibly, uh, I, I like the way this uh, in actually this translation sort of says he began to send them out two by two. So you know, maybe he took a bit of time with each pair <laughs> and and prepared yeah. them, or and so they weren't just like um, just sent out immediately like that. Um, but I, I just feel that these there's a summary of instructions here that are probably the, the essence is you know this is God's work this isn't this doesn't come from man so it's about trust you know and it, and I don't think it necessarily means you know we don't have to carry a bag with us or whatever but the, the, the essence is trust you know the trust is the key um, rather than us just trying to literally apply it to our, ourselves today. Um, and God is the source, you know, this, this, this kingdom doesn't come through man's, <laughs> has, it's, it's come despite man, the, the very best or worst man can do. Um, so it's going to be shared through the spirit of God, not, not through man's efforts. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, David. That's absolutely what I see as well. I think this idea of, well, I think the phrase is something like evangelical poverty. I think it's, it's not about necessarily being really poor uh, financially and so forth, but it's actually underlying, this is underlying their dependence. And they, they mustn't trust in their own resources. It's trusting in God um, and Jesus's authority. Um, and I mean, I, having said that, I, I'm just thinking to myself, I'm, I'm just comparing what it says here to the same little bit in Matthew and Luke and I'm thinking oh actually there's some big differences and I wonder what you thought about that had you had you had you reflected on that yes I mean I, I think that um I know the walk the walk the staff doesn't appear in the other verses, other versions but Mark says to, you know you can take a staff I think in, Ma in Matthew it's in Matthew it says don't take a staff it's right. kind of <laughs> the opposite <laughs> And I, I and I think we can hold these things fairly loosely. I mean, a, a, st a staff could just be the walking stick, which is would be normal to take. I think um, maybe um, maybe Matthew is referring to don't take something to try and you know f protect yourself with in a fight. You know, that's not the that's not the nature of what you're doing. So maybe yeah. there's a different emphasis. I, I did read one comment that uh, the bag was perhaps. To do with don't take a begging sack like like a beggar would beg for money so that was maybe the addition to to not to bring the bag with you but i think at the end of the day the source is god and uh, so they can go out and trust that that god's going to provide as as the as the message goes out he'll provide a place for them to stay i thought it was interesting that they they're told not to shift around from place to place you know you need to go to a, a home and, and rest there uh, and make that your base um, I just get the feeling that there's, there's something about rest that comes through the message that comes mm -hmm. out. You know, you go way, way back to, um, you know, Jesus has been demonstrating the kingdom. And then, you know, when we get that story of the storm in, in Mark 4, you know, Jesus is asleep at the back of the boat. <laughs> so while the disciples are like, you know, hands up in horror, help, we're all going to drown. What's Jesus doing? He's asleep. Uh, why? Because he's in a place of total rest and, and peace about who he is and, and who the Father is and that the Spirit is there, you know, the, the, the Trinity is present. Uh, and, and so, you know, that comes from a place of rest. And here we have like, you know, don't race around like, you know, oh, I've got a, I've got a, uh, I've, I've got a program to meet. I've got, a, I've got to rush around this village. And, 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 and but it, there's something about, you know, just find a place, find a man of peace. I think that comes in another version, you know, find a man of peace, just stay there, just, uh, and just allow the, allow this, this 
powerful word to do its work you know just as you demonstrated it, it doesn't come through man's striving it comes through the power of god so so let's 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 get our priorities right you know? yeah, that's brilliant that's brilliant i mean I, I i was hearing i was talking to a friend about this who happens to be our next guest uh, on the podcast the other day and he was saying it's really interesting this idea of not depending on these kind of masses of resources and money actually how different that can be to the way the church sometimes operates that actually resources are really really emphasized in some in some quarters and i think that's is it really helps to kind of get our feet on the ground by reading a passage like this doesn't it to recognize that actually it all boils down to trust as you say um i, I think again i owe this to him this 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 man who's uh, our next guest john burnett because he, he pointed out to me actually that this bit about sandals is it and sandals and the staff mm. and, and and as we say it's in matthew it's slightly different in luke i don't think it's i don't know if the sandals are mentioned at all they may be the staff certainly isn't um but it may be mark had something else in mind apart from what we're talking about which is about dependence and trust um he said if you looked up exodus 12 11 what you find there is a description of what the israelites were to take with them on the night of the Passover. Mm. Get up in haste and don't take anything with you except a staff and your sandals. Mm. So there's something about Passover here in Mark, I think was really interesting about moving from a place of slavery to a place of freedom uh, under God's leader. Um, yeah. 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 And, and interesting. Isn't it fascinating? Go on, Go on David. Luke 15, okay, if we were to jump to another gospel, you know, there the prodigal comes home and what does the father give him? Sandals for his feet. So it speaks something of sonship, uh, something of, yeah. you know, and, and these are adopted sons of the father who are going out with a message. So there's perhaps something there, there's an, uh, an illusion there that maybe the, the hearers at the time would also have picked up, you know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if this is true, that, but I, I understand at the time, um there were other kinds of wandering preachers um one of them being the cynics who one kind who called the cynics who apparently would be wearing all sorts of trappings of of uh, authority and power and riches and so forth so maybe this is also a kind of attempt by jesus to distinguish his own followers from these other guys mm -hmm. interesting david i loved what you said earlier about how jesus began and he i, I just imagining him taking them two by two, two at a time and, and saying, right, this is what I want you to do. Are you okay with that? And just really reassuring them because it does seem like a big shock, doesn't it? Um, I, I don't know if we're moving on too quickly, but the shaking of the dust off your feet as a testimony against places who won't welcome you, that seems seems a bit harsh. Is, that, is, he, is he making a point there? I think we better mention at this point that in some versions of Mark's gospel, not necessarily the oldest manuscripts, there is an extra little bit at the end of verse 11. It talks about it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment uh, for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah than it would be for those people um, who, who haven't listened. Um, so that's an interesting twist that maybe we could talk about. I don't know. I think it's interesting the lens we look at things like this through, you know, and, um, you know, over the over the centuries there have been different, uh, perhaps, perspectives in, in the in Christian understanding. And but I think, you know, it one thing that I think has been unhelpful is, is this sort of idea idea of a God of retributive justice, yes. you know. <laughs> That, that is not what our God is like. Yeah. Jesus came, you know, to, to seek and save the lost. The Father came to, you know, to to redeem uh, the world, to, to heal, uh, and so. Uh, and I wonder if that extra verse was added by some people who, you know, who were trying to bring more of a like, yeah, but God's going to get you sort of um, yeah. emphasis. I don't know, but I I have enjoyed. I don't know if you've heard of the mirror translation by Francois de Toy. He uh, is a South African who, who's um, been working his way through uh, paraphrasing the, the New Testament and uh, he hasn't unfortunately done Mark but he has done Luke and of course there's a parallel passage and I, I'll just can I just read you what he put for a similar 
from this verse in yeah. Luke. Is that he said, if, um, if people don't receive you, move on, in brackets, shake the dust off your feet. Don't carry the negative energy with you. Don't take it personally or be offended. Mm. So more like, this is more like uh, demonstrating something with sort of shaking the dust off your feet and you know, like, okay, well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna carry all that. You know, they didn't, they didn't receive it, but we're going on, there's others who will. But, but look, this is quite a clear demonstration because we're shaking, uh, shaking the dust off our feet here as we walk out of the village. You know, you, you've, you've heard the message now, you know, be provoked. <laughs> yeah, Consider yeah I, I agree totally with that. I think the idea is that you have made your choice. Um, and um, again, I have to say this isn't my, my idea. <laughs> I feel a bit of a phony here now. But again, this is my friend John who... Uh, I was quite staggered by this because he said to me the other day, um, actually not in the Bible, but fairly soon after the Bible in some Jewish writings, there was this idea of shaking the dust off your feet. And what it meant was if you were traveling from Gentile territory like Tyre and Sidon and you were going back into Israel, well, that territory you've been in is unclean. So basically you're shaking the dust off your feet as a sign of you're going back into Holy Land and you don't want to have anything of the other stuff with you the, the unclean stuff mm. and to do that if that's true and it's relevant here that means what they're doing is saying well you've you've kind of made your choice you know what we're offering you is god's plan for humankind and you know are you going to be part of the plan are you going to be part of that project you're going to be joining in the kingdom of god has arrived what's your decision yeah. and they've said no no i'm not interested for whatever reason and that means they've made their choice. So it's almost saying, you know, well, we'll move on then because we're moving from a place that has made a decision not to be with God on this. This is, this is what God's offering. You've decided not to decide to go with that. Um, I don't know what you think about that idea. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, you know, they're dealing with impure spirits and impure response. You know, it's almost mm. like a shaking off of both. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that. Therefore, this action is like condemning the village. You know, no. it, I think this is just like at, at this stage in the journey. It's just, in a sense, a warning. But it's yeah. not. It's not like uh, um, there's no hope now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I find it hard to accept that idea of no hope. Um, Okay, shall we move on to the next next section? The final section is, uh, so they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them, which is great. They were told to go and have authority over impure spirits and they ended up anointing sick people and healing them as well. Were there, were there more demons around in those days than there are these days? I mean, we you can count on the fingers of one hand the number of demons you've driven out. I don't know. <laughs> You can't, but, um, I can't. What's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> I, think it, I mean, it obviously depends on your demonology <laughs> and what you what you understand by these things. I no, I don't think there would be more. Well, I think we're, I think we're, you know basically they're just perhaps not as um, overt today. We not we we you know. If we go to Africa or somewhere like that, you know, there's a lot more uh, sense of contention and whatever. But I, I think it does, for me, provoke some questions about demons and what what demons are. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, except there's a spiritual dimension there that it's from darkness, not from light. Uh, but um, but darkness, uh, you know, we know has actually no substance. Light has substance. Darkness is the absence of light. So, uh, you know, what's going on here? Uh, what are these impure spirits? And, uh, and for me, there's a connection to that bit that pe the people should, they preach that people should repent. Repent is, you know, we know the word metanoia um, in the Greek. Um, you know, so I think, unfortunately, we've in our... English translations, the word repent suggests sort of uh, penance and, you know, a, and a sort of um, groveling for sin, whereas really the, the meaning is more, you know, as we know, to think differently, to, to come, come with a fresh perspective. Um, uh, I 
got the yeah the, the thing here the the two parts of metanoia meta which means together with and the noia part is to perceive with the mind so we're talking about something to do with the mind here um and so repent really suggests an awakening of the mind or a, a realignment of one's thinking one's reasoning a, clearly a realignment to got from god's to god's perspective to see things how actually they really are not in the delusion of men's minds or the darkness that 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 we know you know mankind has has, has re retreated into uh, so if that if we link that back to the demons um you know that when paul talks about demons and so forth a lot we we see the sense of strongholds of the mind that you know and how how ways of thinking become become uh un, unhealthy and maybe going right back to the garden of eden to to you know the the mindset that caused adam and eve to hide from god you know their sense of um uh, and so there's that whole sense of shame and guilt and all those things build up strongholds of the mind which can in turn then open the way for sickness and and all sorts of other things um uh, you know maybe thoughts that spring from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil rather rather than from the tree of life so it's all to do with with the wrong source and so what these people are being presented with is look think differently come and drink from the true source yeah. <laughs> which is the, the tree of life or the water of life or whatever metaphor we want to use but you know this is this is where life is it's a father who loves you who's you know and and it's not all about the um the, the, the trappings of religion uh, the, uh, and, and the outward. This is about uh, something of the heart that God wants for you and has for you. You know, this is, he's, he's, he's um, a lovesick father who's seeking to draw his kids back to himself. Come and believe, come and trust, come and receive this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that's brilliant. And perhaps for me, the word repent also, because I agree about the changing mind, but also I think it has to do perhaps with the where it came in originally in this gospel, repent and believe the good news. So, you know, then it begins to, you have to begin to wonder what is the good news that Jesus preached. And from that verse, I think in chapter 1, 14 and 15, it, it talks about believe the good news, the kingdom of God is near, or rather, as it should be translated, I think, the kingdom of God has come, it has arrived, it's here now. Um, that's the good news. And so it's to change your thinking from where you were about, you know, where, where is God? <laughs> it's happened. It's happening. Um, and maybe for the Jews in those days, there was a lot of uncertainty about, you know, what God was doing. Um, is, he, is he with the zealots? Uh, should we join a rebellion against the Romans? Is that, is that what the Messiah is all about? Um, but Jesus came to suggest that the Messiah was very different to that expectation. Yeah. We're coming to, have, have, going to have to come to a close fairly soon, gentlemen. Um, have you got any sort of last thoughts, that, things that you've been saving up and hoping you have a chance to say? Can I, can I, can I jump in uh, to mention that this is not the end of the story as far as this passage is concerned? And we were talking about this earlier before we started recording. There is another verse, not officially in the podcast, but when you get to verse 30, it says, the apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught so that in between those two sections is the story of john the baptist um and i i don't know i think i don't know what you think but when i've performed this bit i've always felt slightly awkward uh, it doesn't sound like the apostles are coming off particularly well here they've had, they gathered around jesus and they report to him all that they all that they <laughs> have done yeah well we've done we've done this we've done that and I don't know, well, that's not quite the spirit Jesus sent them out in. I think, I think the point is from the passage we've looked at today, it's uh, you're going out in my authority and you're dependent on me and dependent on God to do these works. And they've come back with this kind of more gloating. And for me, that fits in very well with how things develop in the story. They get all antsy about who's the best, who's the finest, who's the, who's the greatest, you know, who's going to be most powerful in the kingdom. It's, 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 you know, it's a, a kind of a warning to us that actually it's so easy to kind of take, take the, the authority that God gives us and make it our own. Yes. Yeah. yeah. David, have you got any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, to me, the, you know, the, 
what they've been sent out to do is to bring this um, healing wholeness. You know, the, the message is that message of wholeness. That's, you know, we know the word salvation, sozo, means sort of wholeness. It's, it's peace. It's health. It's, it's a fully rounded thing. And, you know, so they're, they're releasing people from these demonic strongholds of the mind, but they're also anointing with oil and bringing healing. And there seems to be you know, this is all. This is all the essential part of the kingdom of God. And 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 as the story goes on, and, and you know, when you eventually get to the end of Mark, you know, we see that the disciples still are going out doing it. At the very end, the last verse of Mark is, you know, they went. The disciples went everywhere and preached, and the Lord went, worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. So you know, we, we're seeing them here at the beginning of that. And at the end of Mark, we're still going on doing that, and right down the centuries to today, this is this is the uh, the wonderful good news, the the, the unveiling of the wonder of, of Jesus Christ that that we are commissioned with. Well, what what an encouraging finish uh, way to end. Uh, thank you so much, David. I think we're going to have to wrap wrap up the conversation for now. Uh, David and Stefan, it's been a real pleasure and hopefully we will have started many more conversations among our listeners. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us today, David Hewitt and Stefan Smart. And if you have any thoughts about what's been discussed, do share them on the I Am Mark community on Facebook. And you should also find a prompt there to submit questions for future episodes of Question Mark. Please join us again or listen to previous episodes on YouTube, Spotify and Apple Music platforms. However, the best place to find us is the I Am Mark page on Facebook. This is where you can find links to watch previous episodes of Question Mark, both in joining the conversation and even submit your questions for future episodes. Thank you, gentlemen, and goodbye for now. Uh, do join us next time, listener, and we'll see you. If you enjoyed this episode of Question Mark and don't want to miss any future episodes, be sure to click on the subscribe button. This also means other people can find the podcast and join the conversation too. We'd also love if you could leave a review so we know what was good and what we can improve for future episodes. If you want to find out more about I Am Mark, Stefan Smart's solo word-for-word dramatisation of Mark's gospel, go to www.sleek.bio slash I Am Mark, where you can sign up for free for his newsletter and a whole host of other goodies. Join us and our special guests next time, where we'll continue to explore the greatest story ever told together. If you want to get involved with the podcast or have any questions or comments in the meantime, please do get in touch using the I Am Mark social media channels. We'd love to hear from you. We light it up, we won't come down, and the sun can't stop us now. Watching it come true, it's taking over you. And this is the greatest show, where it's covered in all the colored lights, and the runaways are running the night. Impossible comes true, it's taking over you. And this is the greatest show.